Today we're talking about the Aeneid, or Rome's founding myth. Um, and so, we're going to get a little bit of context uh, for being able to understand this. A lot of times, um, you might be familiar with uh, the Roman Empire at its height, um, and indeed that's the actual context, uh, or the very beginning of the Roman Empire is the actual context for this text, because this is when it's composed, and yet, nevertheless, it is um, attempting to narrate, uh, into the mythic past anyway, um, preceding eras in Roman history or looking at, looking at uh, uh, historical memory in Rome and trying to uh, create myths around that. And so I just want to look at a little bit, um, a couple centuries before um, in the main period of the Roman Republic. And so Rome here in the middle, uh, Rome at a certain point has beaten off uh, Pyrrhus and has essentially its first colonies after its first war with Carthage. This is at the beginning, it's about to have a, uh, this what's called the Second Punic War, which is to say the second war with the Roman Republic uh, over control of the Western Mediterranean with the great um, Punic or Phoenician city-state of Carthage with its whole empire that already included at this point uh, much of Spain. You might know the um, it's just an interesting um, tidbit, it has nothing to do with anything, but anyway, Carthago, or Carthage, just means new city in Phoenician, and then Carthago Noa, which is to say Cartagena, uh, means new, new city, <laughs> and then I think there's a new Cartagena too, right? Cartagena Nueva, or something like that, and so then that's new, new, new city, so I like that. <laughs> anyway, it's like all of the places that are where the river is a, the word for river, and then it's called river, river, like, anyway. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of places the like Phoenicians that. Weren't known for inventiveness. Yeah, the Phoenicians, not that inventive of people. So yeah, this is a, brings a good point. So if you're ha you, a lot of you haven't been here before. Um, so in a quick comment like that, I can repeat the comment so that people can hear us online. But if you have a long comment or a question, we have a microphone, and so we'll pass you guys the mic. Uh, because all the people watching online, there's usually more people online than here, and they really enjoy your comments. And we also remind people who are joining us online that if you type your comments into the um, Facebook chat, Leandro can ask the question. So we were dealing before with, uh, a couple weeks ago we did uh, Cleopatra and essentially the end of the Hellenistic kingdoms. This is when this is still uh, at the height of the Hellenistic period as Rome is emerging though as the new great power in the West. It's right after this second war when the Carthaginians are really defeated that Rome becomes the greatest power of the ancient world here. But still at this stage um, the heirs of Alexander, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies especially, um, are, the, are the perceived anyway to be the greater or um, more sophisticated powers. All right, so we did a little bit of a timeline, <laughs> so you can also get a, some context scope. I like to have a little bit of a blueprint here so we can kind of see it. So the text here that we're going to be looking at, the Aeneid, is written here at the end of Virgil's life as they're counting down here to get you know, to the end of before Common Era, at the end of BC. Obviously, they weren't actually counting that way, <laughs> but we in history retrospectively are doing that, and so uh, Virgil is writing there, and what he's trying to do, you know, is go back and actually talk about a time period, not only um, at, not of tr Rome's traditional founding, but in fact, all these generations before, where did the ancestors of the people who founded Rome come from? So setting it back into this traditional, anyway, time period of the Trojan War. Um, there is a historical kernel here, but the Trojan War is understood by ancient people as a, uh, it would, would have been the mythic version, the, the version that's um, told in the Iliad and Odyssey and the other ancient Greek poets. Those, um, so this event, you know, to the extent that there was a real event, um, took place prior to that t thing we always talk about, the Bronze Age, Bronze Age collapse, when these ancient empires, the Hittites, the Mycenaeans, um, all fell and the Greeks lost even literacy. And so there's this period that's called the Dark Ages because we don't have any, any text from it. So when text starts to emerge, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are oral compositions, um, that are telling that, that kind of memory, but actually is more referring to this kind of time period because authors are always talking about their own context, no matter what they're trying to narrate, they've, they've forgotten, uh, and there's no historical memory. Uh, and so the Iliad and the Odyssey are maybe being orally composed in this kind of time period and are maybe, they're traditionally written down in 527. 
And so already, therefore, centuries and centuries old, you know, five centuries old by the time um, we're getting to the Aeneid, which is the Roman sequel to these ancient great uh, works. And so that's also then um, the period of time that we'll look at is the, you know, the kings of Rome, the Roman Republic, and then the immediate context that Virgil has been having has been the different civil wars that we've been talking about, uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar, and then later his successor, Augustus, um, victories over their arrivals. But then looking back to earlier things, those wars with Carthage, those wars with uh, Greeks. Is that clear? So, <laughs> just want to lay some ground so we can kind of see that. We'll come back to all those things, but I just kind of want to see the, the scope of that in a chronology. So who founded the city of Rome? The wolf, <laughs> the Romul Romulus and Remus, right? And so we have here Romulus maybe and Remus, whoever's the, whoever was the one's which. Um, this particular um, image is a, um, a Renaissance or, uh, you know, uh, little babies that got put in to an older she-wolf. Traditionally, the she-wolf um, uh, had been thought to be uh, Etruscan. So a very, in other words, very, very ancient, going all the way back to um, that time period. It's now also possibly um, thought to be medieval. So it's not clear if it's super ancient or if it's actually a lot newer than we thought. <laughs> anyway, that's still being worked out. Uh, but in any event, we know when the babies were made, and so that's later. But it's still part of an ancient tradition that goes all the way back, these Romulus and Remus. However, as is so often the case when we're dealing with, with myth, um, there isn't one particular single story and that story doesn't simply begin completely systematized like we now think of maybe modern history. So in fact, um, if we're going back to the time of Virgil, when Virgil is answering that question, who, wrote, who founded the city of Rome, he will have had actually multiple different um, traditions and uh, current myths and stories to go from. Uh, to answer that question for himself. So he would definitely know that, he, and did know, he knows all of these stories. Uh, the Romulus story, so in other words, there is this guy who is the twin son of a Latin priestess, so a Vestal virgin, Rhea Silvia, and um, when she's supposed to be a virgin, nevertheless, she's been seduced by the Roman god Mars, who is um, an important god in the Roman pantheon, equivalent of Ares, <coughs> a less important god in the Greek, um, and when her uh, relatives, she's a, a princess of a Latin kingdom, um, find out, you know, this is very embarrassing, and so they have the, the children exposed, and being exposed, then they're raised by a wolf, right? Uh, so that's the Romulus and his twin brother Remus story. There's another um, very early story, maybe the earliest answer that people had to this, uh, that there's a guy, a Greek hero named Evander, who uh, is from the area of Greece called Arcadia, so the Peloponnesus. Uh, Evander is the son of, in, in, in Romans legend, Mercury, in the Greek side from Hermes, um, and it's the equivalent god. Um, and so there was a thought that uh, he came maybe and introduced all of the different types of civilization to the area that becomes Rome. Uh, the Aeneas, and so we're going to talk especially about that one today, but so this idea that there is this Trojan prince who is the son in the, in the Roman pantheon of Venus or in the Greek uh, Aphrodite. Uh, and then there's also a story that there's this guy, Romos, who is Ulysses' son. And so as Ulysses, or as the Greeks had him, Odysseus, as he's doing, going on all his major um, important journeys of the Western Mediterranean, uh, he has a son at some point with, uh, uh, what's the nymph that he's hanging out with? Uh, Circe. Circe, is, yeah. And so he has a, 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 a child by her, and that kid stays you know, when he goes up back off to uh, Ithaca. And so then that kid, Romos, uh, uh, is the founder then of Rome. And so a bunch of those different answers. So if we look at these, um, <coughs> these so the Greeks, um, had begun to settle southern Italy already by the uh, 8th century BCE. So essentially when the Romans even start to think of themselves as, you know, in their mythic past of when Rome was being founded, they're already aware that there's Greeks around. And so Greeks are part of their um, kind of legendary tradition. And indeed, when we say this word, um, 
I'm, we're Westerners, or I'm a Westerner, and I'm a, also a Latin, and so I always think of everything from the Latin and Roman perspective as opposed to the Greek perspective. So Greeks don't call themselves Greek. Greek is, a, is the Latin word for Greek, right? And that comes from the fact that the area of southern Italy was called Magna Graecia, and so this was called the Greece proper originally in terms of the, um, where that word is. They're calling, the Greeks are saying Hellas and things like that, Aeolia, for the parts of uh, what we now call Greece. <laughs> But anyway, because this was the area that the Romans first encountered these guys, they're like, oh, they're all Greeks, right? So it's all Greek to me for the Romans. <laughs> so there's a, the word Roma uh, sounds like the Greek word Rome, which means strength, um, and that's a good an association to have. So the Romans like that as an etymology, and so they think maybe that that's where the name for their city comes from, that it's Greek for strength. And so um, early traditions give Rome a Greek founder. So we mentioned this guy Evander from Arcadia, uh, and that he went to Rome uh, a couple generations before or a generation before the Trojan War. And then the other option would be, like we say, um, Odysseus, who in the Odyssey is one of the very most important heroes of that um, ancient Greek identity stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the hero of the Odyssey, um, the fact that he is wandering around this whole territory that becomes the Roman heartland, the Western Mediterranean, um, it made sense to them that maybe one of his kids or somebody associated with him, his son in this case, um, would be the founder. Uh, and so maybe one of the reasons why um, we're getting as possibly even the earliest stories that are answers to the question, uh, who founded Rome? Where did Rome come from? Is that this question is kind of a Greek question to begin with. So the Greeks were very interested in these kind of um, mythic stories and mythic origin stories. And not everybody in all of these ancient civilizations necessarily thinks in those terms or thinks in terms of the kind of pantheons that have lots of mythic stories to them. And so uh, the Romans had different gods in an ancient religion that they started associating with the Greeks when, when they got all of this wealth of Greek imagery in the form of massive amounts of pottery that the Etruscans and Romans were continually importing. It's um, uh, the best place to find um, ancient Athenian pots is Tuscany, uh, because the Etruscans were just, you know, loved the stuff. <laughs> so they're just importing it there. And so they are also importing these stories. And that's why uh, we often are um, uh, doing the syncretism where I'll say, Ares equals Mars, Zeus equals Jove, or Jove Pater, Jove Father, Jupiter, um, uh, and so on, Aphrodite, uh, Venus. So another story, though, uh, that doesn't have a Greek origin is this Romulus story that I mentioned, so first mythic king. Um, so the Romans did look back to, uh, at this whole time, um, this is the end of the Republic when Virgil is writing, but they did have a historical memory of a long period of the Republic and they looked back to uh, the foundation of the Republic um, as a pivotal moment in, in their history. Uh, preceding that, they had a, a series of kings. They're largely just legendary, so we can't say maybe the last few or have more historical basis, but certainly going all the way back to the first one. And so um, one of the stories then that they tell is their first um, uh, legendary king, Romulus, who is also an eponymous hero, uh, by which we mean to say a lot of times when people, just in that same way, there's that Romus son, he's another <coughs> eponymous hero. So a lot of times if you, um, you want to say, well, who is the founder of Israel? Well, it's a guy named Israel, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so they make up a story about it, that guy, Israel. Or there may well have been any, other, any others of those. So ultimately, um, this whole Trojan origin story becomes so popular, because of course the Romans are um, very influential, that later in the Middle Ages, when the Franks, uh, when the people who are the ancestors of the modern French, uh, when the Franks uh, um, tell their origin story, well, it turns out that they also are descended from Trojan princes. So there was a Trojan prince named Francus, <laughs> and so an eponymous ancestor of the Franks, and he ultimately you know, led them all on a different journey, and they ultimately 
uh, you know, descended down to a guy named Merovich, who's the eponymous ancestor of the Merovingians, the original royal family of the Franks, right? So anyway, that same kind of thing always is kind of happens. So if you, you're sitting around, you're saying, well, we have a town called Rome. We must have had an ancestor, Romus, that started the whole thing, and that's where that came from. And so Romulus is that kind of a, a, a story. So we said a little bit about the story. So there is a, um, a, a Latin princess. So the Latins are a, a tribe that are speaking that Latin language. Um, and there's multiple different uh, cities, not just Rome, that um, speak Latin as their original language. And so uh, there's a king named Numitor, who's one of the Latin kings. He has a daughter who is a Vestal Virgin, so a priestess who is not uh, to the goddess Vesta, who is not supposed to um, have relations with, for example, gods like Mars. <laughs> Um, but and sometimes guards like Mars aren't taking no. And so uh, she ends up having then twins. There's all sorts of um, mythic uh, origins where you have twins, you know, where there's, um, you know, everybody be it from Hercules actually has a twin brother, uh, Castor and Pollux. Um, we were mentioning before uh, Israel, so um, uh, his, his, he has a brought twin brother, uh, Esau, so his original name, Jacob. So anyway, there's all these kind of mythical, um, in all, a lot of these myths, there is a twin brother. In fact, um, in, in the, uh, uh, the Gnostic um, uh, stories of Jesus, Jesus has a, has a twin brother. And so we hear of this um, uh, apostle Thomas. Well, Thomas is uh, uh, Aramaic for twin. <laughs> And he's sometimes called Didymus Thomas, which is Greek. His Greek word for twin is Didymus, right? <laughs> so anyway, so the idea of it is there's a there's a often there's a divine uh, twin, and then there's a mortal twin. So there's Jesus and Thomas, and there's lots of them that are like that, right? Okay, uh, there's the other story that we're going to cover here a lot, but anyway, we'll just give the the, the thumbnail of it here. There's this idea. Uh, that there is a prince of Troy, Aeneas, um, who uh, uh, is the founder of Rome. And so although the guy is kind of a, only a minor figure in the Iliad, he nevertheless kind of plays a prominent role and we'll see why, um, if you're gonna write a sequel, he was a good, good character to pick and build from. <laughs> Um, already then by the third century, this is a, something that's quite well known. We can't always tell you know, the origins of myths because we don't have the beginning, we don't have the oral stuff at all. But what we can say is that by the time um, one of these Hellenistic rulers, one of Alexander the Great's heirs, a guy named King Pyrrhus, uh, he's a king of an area called Epirus, which is kind of like where Albania is in that greater Albania area. Um, so he considered himself, like Alexander, to be a descendant of Achilles. And when he decided that he was going to be like an Alexander and instead of conquering the whole East, he was going to maybe make a name for himself by conquering the whole West. And he took a giant army to Italy and, and started um, trying to uh, defend what, we, what I was just calling Magna Graecia, which in other words, the Greek Southern Italy from uh, Roman and other uh, Latin and Italic incursions. Uh, he fought big wars against the Romans, and he won every single battle. <laughs> but he lost so many of his men in doing it, uh, uh, and so he up, lost up to three quarters of all of his uh, troops and supplies winning those battles because of how tenacious the Romans were. And so this is the origin of our term Pyrrhic victory, right? So it's named for this guy Pyrrhus, who really won, but lost by winning. <laughs> so he had one more war with the Romans, and he would have been, had nothing. <laughs> So what is the picture? So um, this is a vase uh, uh, from, that's kind of, what I'm trying to show here is that before um, the Romans are using this, this actually is a Greek myth, right? And so we can see here um, in a Greek pay vase, these are black figure vase. And so there's a guy here in a, in a, who's a, got an armor on, right? And so that's Aeneas. And he's carrying a guy on his back. <laughs> So that's his father, Anchises, who is uh, lame and can't walk on his own. And he's got um, at least, he's probably holding hands here with his son here, who is Ascanius. And I don't know, there's another boy. <laughs> and uh, maybe, there, maybe it's the second son in, in the Greek story. Um, 
if so, he didn't make it to Rome. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so he's bringing his son, and, and then what I think is happening here is uh, he's being urged on by the goddess Venus. So I think that this is probably Venus, as a, or Aphrodite, as opposed to his wife, who doesn't figure in or doesn't make it in the, in the Greek stories. But that's my understanding of it. So that's essentially the story of this Trojan prince. He's fleeing Troy as it's falling and he's carrying his, his dad on his back while he's doing it. And so that's kind of the most famous um, image of Aeneas, and we'll see it a bunch of different times here. So, uh, so I mentioned um, you know, how this myth had already gotten, uh, taken hold uh, in the Romans, and so this King Pyrrhus was you know, pretty much playing up the fact that in the same way that there had been this Trojan War and Achilles fought against the Trojans, so too Pyrrhus as a second uh, Achilles, as another Alexander, was going to go fight these Romans who are just the Trojans and he's going to have another Trojan War and it'll be a wonderful, uh, glorious thing. Uh, so too, a little bit before that, when, the, uh, when we had the first Punic War, which is to say the war that the Romans fought against the Phoenicians, against the Carthaginians, there was in, Car they had uh, the divided Sicily among them. So Carthage is a major power in what's now Tunisia. That's where Carthage is. And so they had as an overseas colony, uh, this western part of the island of Sicily. Syracuse was a, uh, a very important Greek city-state in its own right, and there was a, a little here, Messina is essentially the, um, a little ally of the Roman Republic at this point. And so um, part f control of Sicily is one of the things that, uh, and shipping of, through the Western Mediterranean, therefore, is one of the things that the Romans and the Carthaginians are fighting over. So one of the things that happens uh, at the outbreak of the First Punic War is the city of Segesta over here. Um, they rebel against Carthage and they send letters to Rome saying, hey, <laughs> we were founded by Aeneas. You know, so when Aeneas came here, uh, you know, his, his Trojans came here, uh, we were founded and then, you know, then we know you're founded by the Trojans too, so we should be allies against these Carthaginians. <laughs> and so uh, the Romans, what? Convenient. Yeah, very convenient, right? So it was a, it was a very good PR. <laughs> on the part of the, uh, you know, the Segestans, because not only did the Romans win that war, uh, but the Segestans were made allies in full, in, in full standing, you know, so they were not only freed as a city, but became um, you know, a free ally of the Romans, and so they weren't subject to taxation and everything like that, because they're essentially kinspeople, right? And so likewise, then, in the ongoing centuries, uh, as the Romans start intervening more and more in Greece proper, so when they go across and they, uh, they take over Epirus um, after Pyrrhus is gone, and they start taking over things like Macedonia and things like that, so in other words, making their way into what we more think of as Greece proper and the Balkans. Um, then some of the Greek city-states, which are continually warring with each other, you know, they're having fights with each other, and one of them uh, has the bright idea, hey, if you go through the entire Iliad, and there's like a list of all the different Greek cities that sent ships to attack Troy, we're not on that list. And normally that has been a bad thing, because we don't have any honor and all these things, but now we wrote, they write to the, to the Romans in the Senate and say, hey, all of these cities that attacked Troy, you know, are attacking us, and we didn't attack you, so you should, you should defend us. And so the Senate debated that, and they said, okay, that makes sense. And so they defended that city. So anyway, it was a good way that people started to have to um, have, you know, in other words, it's a, it's a mythic origin, but in other words, people are taking it seriously enough that it's affecting contemporary politics, uh, so they're believing it, right? Okay. Oh, really? Your family's from Agrigento? Uh, Agrigento. Uh, our, yeah. Uh, yeah. They didn't believe in both the Greek. <laughs> now I have the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> what's it called? What's it Agrigento called now? Is it? It's uh, Agrigento. Oh, it is. Okay. So, but um, a lot of the records Agrigas. were destroyed. Okay. So I just found out all about this two years ago, so I'm trying to trace back even back in the worst time. Yeah. Um, this, is this microphone on? The microphone yeah. is on. I'm sorry, we're supposed to hand the microphone. We need to, to, to use talk. the microphone because we're sorry, live so. on Facebook. Sure. No, I just, uh, I'm not sure it's working. It is working. It is working. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Test. test, test. I thought it was working. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, the point of it is um, audience member here, she is from right here. And right here, by the way, the best 
the best preserved Greek and temples in all of yeah. in anywhere uh, right here, right? Is yeah, it? Or, there, there, there apparently, there's still some areas where people speak Greek today. Oh wow! Uh, oh yeah. And uh, we visit, I, I went there and we visited the temples and. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I still want to know about all the records uh, that that were, that were destroyed and if anything has surfaced. Yeah. Or, so the. So the question is, yeah, I mean, uh, anyway, there's so many Greek ruins. This was a very important Greek settlement. Obviously, Syracuse was a massive Greek city, and there were Greeks all over the place. Uh, but Sicily has been conquered so many times, um, uh, again and again and again, actually, uh, that not a, lot of, not a lot of records have survived, um, at least in Sicily. So other records have been survived other places. So. Interesting. Okay. So... Another Aeneas. <laughs> so Julius Caesar, um, as you could imagine, at the time period we're getting to when the Aeneid is being composed, um, Caesar becomes the most important popularizer of uh, Aeneas as Rome's founder. Uh, he, in fact, apparently wore, uh, when he would go into battle, often red boots, which are meant to be in imitation of Aeneas. So Aeneas is known for wearing the red boots. And um, anyway, that's an imitation. The patrician clan of the Julii, which is to say um, Julius Caesar's clan. So if you think of the, if you look at the a Roman name, how it works, his name is Gaius, you know, Julius or Julius Caesar. And so that's his cog, you know, his prinomen is just every, there's only like five or 10, there's 20 different Roman names. It's usually you're named Gaius or uh, Manlius or Publius or Sextus or any of those kind of things. And then, that, and then the second one is your, your cl uh, clan name and then your cognomen. And so anyway, so the big clan here, the patrician clan of the Julii. And so they're one of the, uh, a handful of very important Roman noble families. And that's one of the names why we have names like Julie <laughs> or Julian, uh, and Jules, all of those things are coming from that, from that clan. Um, essentially all the girls would be called Julia, right? Romans are not very inventive when it comes to those names. <laughs> So what the um, Julii claimed is that Aeneas had a son named Julius or Eulus or Julius, uh, depending on how they want to say it. And so that uh, therefore is Caesar is not only a second Aeneas, but in fact, he's a descendant of Aeneas and his, uh, his propaganda or his belief. <laughs> Um, since Aeneas was the son of Aphrodite, then, then obviously the Julii are also descended from Venus, which is an important claim to be able to make, so your divine ancestor. And we saw when we did the Cleopatra lecture that one of the things that freaked everybody out in the Roman Republic, or at least all of the Republicans, uh, the different senators who were afraid that Caesar was going to set himself up as king, um, he set a statue of Cleopatra up. Um, as Venus. So in other words, it's her face and her imagery, but in fact, it's um, meant to be Venus into the statue, into the um, temple of Venus Genetrix, which is on the forum. And so anyway, if you watch the movie, um, it's not necessarily the case, but the senators are all saying, and there's, a, there's an empty pedestal next to it so that when, when Caesar declares himself God, right, then there'll be a divine, you know, statue of him next to it, and then they'll be totally you know, slaves to essentially these Eastern potentates. And so they assassinate him, right? So anyway, he is descended of Venus. Okay, so I mentioned before about this idea of when you have multiple different um, foundational stories, you ha it actually starts out, generally speaking, as a mess. And so um, if we were to go back uh, prior to uh, the composition of the Bible in this, you know, as it's all pieced together in the second temple period, and we go back instead to uh, the first temple period before Jerusalem was destroyed, there would have been all of these different founder ancestors of the Israelite people, right? And they would have had different origins and different origin stories. There would have been a guy, Abram or Abraham, who is either from Ur of the Chaldees or he's from Haran and different depending on how, what the legend was. So they would have had two different ones. There would have been, we mentioned Israel, right? An eponymous ancestor. So in other words, there's a place called Israel or a tribe uh, called Israel. So they anticipate an ancestor that had that same name who ultimately gets conflated with a guy named Jacob uh, who may be a totally different ancestor, but ultimately is understood to be the same one. The Northern Kingdom has a guy named Joseph as one of their ancestral heroes and also a guy named Ephraim, who is also, again, 
eponymous, so the name of uh, one of the tribes is called Ephraim, uh, or Ephraim, we sometimes say in English, but anyway, Ephraim. Uh, likewise, anyway, they have this kind of, their eponymous Northern Kingdom ancestors. The Southern Kingdom, Judah, has an ancestor they named Judah. <laughs> uh, and likewise, then, the kings of Judah have an ancestor, they're called Davidic kings, so the royal house is called the House of David, and so they anticipate there's an eponymous ancestor named David, and the priests have a, are called Aaronid priests, and so they have an eponymous ancestor called Aaron, right? And so anyway, there might be, and then Moses, right? So, and there's traditions that some of these guys are coming from Haran, which is to say the Fertile Crescent, and some of these guys are coming from Egypt. So from either side, there's two ways you can come from, and they come from one or the other, right? And so that's maybe a bunch of different stories when it's originally composed, but by the time that we get it in the final form that we have it now, after the biblical, the many biblical authors wrote down the stories, and after the later editors combined them together to try to make sense of them, the way we see it now is that, okay, of course, Abraham then is the father of Isaac, who is the father of Jacob, whose name gets changed to Israel, so they're the same guy, uh, that he has sons, 12 sons, including a guy named Joseph and a guy named Judah, who are therefore brothers with each other, that Joseph has a son named Ephraim, that Judah has descendants uh, that include David, and that indeed one of the other brothers, Levi, has uh, descendants who are Moses and Aaron, who are made into brothers by one of the biblical writers, right? And so essentially it's a method of taking old stories, combining them together, and now we make a system. So later, writers and editors are interested in systematizing stories um, that have maybe otherwise contradictions. Some of the stories maybe have Abraham being from Ur, other ones have him be from Haran. They explain it by saying, he started in Ur, he went to Haran, he came <laughs> to the land, right? And so um, some of them have Abraham being in Egypt, maybe, and he came, they explain it by he went to Egypt during a famine and he came back, this kind of a thing. Okay, so the same exact thing we're going to see uh, is these probably totally different origin stories um, that were existing at Virgil's time. As Virgil gets a hold of them, he pieces them together uh, in his own kind of rational way, right? And so we have Aeneas uh, as the main character of Virgil's epic here. He is no longer, so this guy Evander is no longer a founder. He's just somebody who helps Aeneas out when Aeneas gets to Italy. Uh, so he's still there, he's still a figure, but he's not the founder anymore. Uh, Aeneas has that son, Ascanius, you know, in the Greek uh, myth, but he now, we understand that Ascanius is just another name for Eulus, so that ancestor of the Julians, eponymous ancestor of the Julian clan, that they then have deep later down that, those descendants who are Romulus, and Remus, who are eponymous again for the city of Rome, and Remus is being maybe that same Romus character, who now no longer has any association with Ulysses or Odysseus. But it's how do we piece all these things together and try to explain it when there are multiple competing stories. And so that's one of the things that's happening here. Okay, so we've seen kind of a little bit of that window into the history going all the way back, um, but what's always most important when we're looking at any text is the context of the author because the authors, um, largely their memory or historical memory, or certainly going back into mythic times, their, their ability is actually substantially less than what we have today, uh, given our additional tools of academic, in the academic discipline of history that wasn't available to them back then, right? And so um, the immediate context of, um, of Virgil is this period of time at the end of the Roman Civil War, when the Roman Republic has kind of rapidly expanded. It has already defeated the Carthaginians and taken over their empire, defeated um, the different successor states, the Seleucids and the uh, Antigonids and, and, and uh, the Macedonians and everybody else, and also over, overshadowed all of um, Greece proper, all the little city-states. Um, and then what has happened now in that second round of civil war, Augustus has uh, conquered, for example, Egypt, right? And so this is now this newly expanded Roman Empire, which is a republic still in name, but has become ruled by one man in fact, so uh, Caesar Augustus. And so this is the immediate context um, that Virgil is thinking about since this is his lifetime. So we'll just go a little bit of a review of this context. So there's a guy, his name is Gaius Octavius. 
So he's adopted, as we saw in the Cleopatra lecture, um, by Julius Caesar when Caesar's will is read. So Caesar's assassinated, his will is read. He names his great nephew, um, Octavius, as his uncle. And so then, if in just in terms of, we sometimes don't think of this. We, we sometimes call this guy Octavius. We sometimes call him Octavian. And we sometimes call him Augustus in, in English, right? And so I just want to show you the origins of that. So his original name is Octavius, which is, uh, his gen's name here in the original Roman, um, he's from this Octavia, Octavii clan. But when he gets adopted by Caesar, uh, which was always, uh, which is a Roman custom to adopt adults even, uh, he takes then Caesar's name, Gaius Julius Caesar, but then he takes the name that's adopted out of name, you know? So Octavianus becomes the special modifier. And so it's not Octavi Octavius anymore, but Octavianus. And so that's why we say Octavian. And so if we know these names, if you know names like Adrian or Hadrian or Fabian, so these are all adoptee, adoptee names, right? So, so Fabius is be like one of the Fabii, right? Fabianus is, you know, adopted out of the, uh, the Fabii. So Claudius, Claude, Claudian, so Julius, Julian. So when we have those extra little parts of that, that's what that's doing. So Octavian, that's why we call him that. Okay, so initially, after Caesar's assassination, he's allied with Caesar's uh, chief lieutenant, Mark Antony, to defeat Brutus and Cassius, the assassins and the senatorial party. However, um, he later fought and broke with Antony and fought uh, to seize complete control of the Republic. So when he does that, when he wins, when Anthony's dead, when Cleopatra's dead, when he's conquered everything, he takes the name Imperator Kaiser Augustus. And so this is a new kind of name entirely. Um, and so um, this is now, um, we saw, saw this whole thing about how Caesar, um, when they threatened to make him, you know, like when he was kind of doing a trial balloon about becoming a king, um, that was so uh, odious to the Roman people, the idea that he would have to take the title Rex, that they assassinated him or the senators assassinated him. So uh, Augustus does something completely different. So he takes a new title, which is simply, um, this just means general at the time. So imperator doesn't mean emperor the way it does for us, it just means general. So all of these guys have been generals and the, you know, the August general Caesar. Uh, and he also then takes the title princeps, which means that he's simply the first among equals of the different senators, to, you know, in name. Obviously, in fact, he's a king, right? So he, but um, anyway, so that we get then that word because he takes titles like that, Augustus, Caesar, those become titles as because of how powerful he is, right? So, um, for example, when we fast forward to, you know, the 20th century, for, there'll be titles like this. Um, so these guys who are all cousins of each other going into World War I and they kind of all look the same. Uh, so George V is emperor, which is that same word imperator. It just, it, meant gen it just meant general in Caesar's day. But now it means emperor, you know, because of, we've had 2,000 years of making that title uh, get big. Likewise, uh, for the Germans, uh, the title Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, right? So that's Caesar. That's pretty obvious. Same thing, the Tsar, the Caesar of Russia, right? And a another one of the titles that was used a lot is Augustus. And so the Greeks, the Byzantines continued to use that as one of their titles. We didn't keep it in the West. Um, actually, I think, I personally think that they tricked, the Byzantines are very tricky. And I think they tricked the Russians and the Germans. <laughs> and so, which is because when the Roman Empire is divided, they, they made four emperors. And the senior emperor was always called the Augustus and the, and the junior emperors were always called the Caesar. And so, and so they must have at some point or other, the Byzantines recognized the German emperors and the, and the Russian emperors as with the name, you know, Caesar. And anyway, so I'm not sure we have to look that up, but it does seem like they've, they tricked us <laughs> anyway, and they were tricked the Westerners and Easterners. So, okay. So one of the things that happens um, when Augustus takes over um, is that um, he has a program of promoting what he thinks of anyway as good old fashioned traditional Roman morals, Roman values. So it's possibly growing out of that fact that he's the guy who's in charge of all kind of the Western provinces, the Latin part of the empire. And we kind of even have seen it certainly 
played up really big in the movie, that Antony is off in the east, he's been Hellenized, he dresses in all things Greek, he loves Greek stuff, he has um, children by Cleopatra that are named, think, you know, have Alexander and Selene and Apollo, you know, these kind of Phoebus, uh, or Helios, I mean, these kind of Greek names. Um, and so instead of having that kind of temptation of uh, foreign queens from the Hellenistic East and also all of the sophistication of the Greeks, um, uh, um, Octavius, Octavian Augustus, this guy uh, with these multiple names, wants to portray himself as, um, as a stalwart Roman conservative. And so here he is, um, this is for Romans, the only difference between if you're a political leader, you have a toga, right? <laughs> Uh, and so that's what a magistrate has. But if you're going to be a priest, you just take the toga and put it over your head like this, and now suddenly you're a religious official. Uh, and so this is him dressed as the Pontifex Maximus, which is to say the supreme uh, pontiff of Rome, which is a title that the, the, the bishops of Rome ultimately take. The popes ultimately um, maintain that Latin title. So among that offices, in addition to being Pontifex Maximus, uh, Augustus also um, was made censor, and so the censors had been this very um, honored position where you get to, um, we think of the word censor, right? You're censoring things. Uh, one of the things they were censoring is, do you get to be a senator or not? So they have a list of who's, who qualifies to be a senator, and so he's made a censor for the purposes of um, cleaning up the morals of the city of Rome, and so if you um, aren't, aren't measuring up as far as he's concerned, he can drop you, for example, from the Senate rolls. Anyway, so Greek vice, Roman morals. Okay, so that brings us to um, Virgil, the author here. So Rome's epic poet in this Augustan age, a guy named Publius, so again, that one of those Roman names at the front, Virgilius, Maro, so we call in English, we say Virgil. Um, he's a major Roman poet. He's living through all of those civil wars, um, and he also there is therefore at there at the end of the Republic, that period of what we call the Principate, but which is to say the very beginning of what we think of as the Roman Empire. Traditionally, he's thought to have been from relatively humble origins, a Roman family in uh, the northern part of Italy, and he has a patron, Mycenas, who is political advisor to Octavian in the Civil War time. Uh, and then later, when Augustus is the emperor, he sort of kind of serves informally as minister of culture. So he's promoting um, all of these sorts of poets like uh, Virgil, uh, who in turn are you know, kind of helping out with the propaganda aspect of what the Augustan uh, era is meant to be all about. And we'll see that in the course of this. So what is Virgil's uh, task that he sets before himself? It's nothing less than essentially writing um, the Romans into the Greek universe. So um, we had that quote earlier that I didn't read out loud, but anyway, that was on the slide that, uh, that, the, that the Romans you know, had conquered, the idea from Horace, the Romans had conquered the Greeks, but the Romans understood the Greeks to be um, more sophisticated than them, and so they were in turn conquered culturally by the Greeks. Um, and so it's critically important then um, for the Romans to explain their origins into this Greek sacred narrative now that they control the Greek world. And so Virgil's epic, the Aeneid, does that. And it's, uh, though, laying claim to very, very particular real estate that ends up being um, very interesting and, and having a particular purpose to it. So the Aeneid itself, so the epic, is modeled directly on the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer, which had been composed centuries earlier, and in some sense it's a sequel. So it's taking place in the same time and then it's continuing. Um, but the difference is, is that the Aeneid is an entirely literary work, so which is to say um, Virgil is writing, and so he's composing text with like, you know, with, with pen and paper, um, uh, papyrus anyway. Uh, it's not an oral composition like those earlier works that predate, you know, that are dating back into that uh, uh, Greek Dark Ages before there actually is writing. Um, and so by following then the last Trojan prince um, out of the Iliad, uh, the Romans become interesting, this interesting anti-Greeks <laughs> within the Greek universe. So they're Greeks, but they're not saying, oh, well, when Odysseus came by, he founded us or something like that, which would essentially give credit to the uh, to the Greeks. Instead, they're saying, yeah, yeah, we were around, but we were fighting you, <laughs> you know, and that kind of thing in this Trojan War, right? 
So we mentioned, so we just to go back, I brought this slide in case, again, in case we needed some context, but we're, um, we're here uh, with Virgil, the composition of the Iliadas are here, and then all the way back thousands of years, you know, a thousand years before uh, Virgil is when the traditional dates anyway of when this event would have taken place, so Aeneas. So, the, I want to look a little bit at the um, source material before we look um, and go through all the themes of the Aeneid. And so what is the character of Aeneas like before Virgil gets a hold of him and makes him what we now think of today? So uh, there's one of the very earliest, um, again, oral compositions going all the way back. Uh, a hymn that's attributed to Homer, a Homeric hymn, the hymn to Aphrodite. And so in this story, Zeus makes Aphrodite fall in love with a Trojan prince, a mortal man named Anchises. And this is him, his payback for all of the times that Venus, so Aphrodite, is constantly making uh, Zeus fall in love with all these mortal women and men <laughs> and getting him in trouble with his wife and everything else. And so now she's got she's to have that uh, payback. So she has a son by Anchises Aeneas, and, and in terms of the Iliad, he's the second cousin to Hector, who is the chief uh, Trojan uh, warrior in the Iliad. So Anchises, though, is told in this hymn not to brag about the fact that he you know, had, a, had a relationship with Aphrodite. It's very hard for a mortal guy not to mention that to his friends, <laughs> so he fails to do that. When he, uh, when he does start bragging about it, Zeus strikes him with a lightning bolt and thereafter he's lame. And so that's why when we see him on all the pots and everything like that, uh, Aeneas has to carry him around, right? I, where did I read this? Um, oh, Greek myths by, oh. That English poet whose name escapes me, maybe it'll come back, who, moved, who was in the First World War. Anyway, um, he tells the story of uh, Anchises hanging around out with some other guys, and one of them says, wouldn't you rather sleep with so-and-so, the daughter of so, such and such, than with Aphrodite himself, herself? And Anchises says, <laughs> Well, no, I slept with both of them. <laughs> <laughs> <Whoops>. <laughs> so yeah, so you got in trouble for it. Anyway, that's a there's a lot of human nature sometimes in Greek myths. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So when Aeneas himself then appears in the Iliad, um, he's set apart as a very special by the gods. So the gods are actually. Um, kind of constantly intervening in the Iliad to save him from different, um, different trouble he gets into. So he's protecting a fallen comrade from one of the Greek heroes, Diomedes of Argo. And so he starts losing that fight. And so Aeneas is saved then by Aphrodite before Diomedes can kill Aeneas. But as she's um, whisking him away, Diomedes gets really mad about it. And he actually is able to wound Aphrodite. Um, at which point uh, Apollo intervenes and uh, warns Diomedes in a pretty famous um, passage where he tells essentially um, that you really shouldn't be messing around with gods because gods look upon you mortals um, as the same way that mortals look upon insects. And so anyway, that's the, that's the context for that quote from Apollo. It's him trying to tell Diomedes not to go after Aeneas. Um, in a different episode, when Aeneas is, um, again, uh, losing a fight with somebody, <laughs> um, uh, Poseidon, who is actually one of the Greek allies under almost all normal circumstances, so the gods are, have taken, taken sides um, in the Trojan War, and some of them are on the Trojan side usually, and some of them are on the Greek side usually. In this case, Poseidon is usually uh, on the Greek side, and nevertheless, Poseidon intervenes to save Aeneas because he points out to everybody who uh, is around wondering why he's doing this, that there has been an important prophecy that Aeneas is fated to be the Trojan prince who survives this war and so that the, the royal house of Troy is not extinguished. And so the line will continue. So the main line that has gone down from through Priam and through Hector, uh, Zeus is done with them. But he wants to preserve uh, this house of, um, anyway, this uh, of Ilium, right? So the royal line. So um, as a result of the prophecy then, dozens um, of Greek cities in the Greek world and actually neighboring cities and uh, all claimed uh, to have been founded by Aeneas. So we saw that about uh, the city in, in Sicily that was claiming it, but th that there's dozens that are claiming that kind of thing. And so, what? 
He's on a hippocamp, yeah. What is that? <laughs> seahorse. So it's a oh. it's a but a big seahorse. It's a it's yeah. a kind of a sea monster horse. Yeah. Okay. So his characteristics that we have, um, going all the way back to the Greeks here, are filial piety, which, um, so we think of that word piety now almost exclusively in relationship to uh, the Judeo-Christian God, usually, so you're pious if you were believing or uh, obedient to God. Um, the word originally is, is really directed in, uh, in Latin to uh, piety to your, your father and your ancestors, your family, so uh, filial piety, we call that now. Um, so, um, the story of the fall of Troy isn't actually in the Iliad, but it is a story that's well known to the ancient Greeks, and so it is depicted. Uh, it's from, and it was in other poems and other, other versions that haven't been survived uh, to us. Um, but, uh, and included in that is again this, this depiction that we keep having of Aeneas. <laughs> with his little boy that he's got along with him, and he's got his dad on his back, right? So this, uh, there's Anchises, the braggart, uh, who's now lame because of the lightning bolt, right? And so uh, he's always doing that. And so the hero is therefore already known in the Greek story for filial piety and for preserving then three generations of the patrilineal, you know, of the patri patriarchal or patrilineal lineage of the Trojan royal house. And it's gonna turn out that actually, in fact, that's something the Romans like. <laughs> you know, so uh, the Romans are kind of a very big into patriarchy, um, and they're big into the father being always right and being the leader, and filial piety is one of their things. And so we can see the same depiction of, um, of uh, Aeneas carrying Anchises on a coin that says Caesar, right? So Caesar, Julius Caesar's coin, and he's also got here um, what's an object now in the Roman story, the penates, which is to say a little idol, uh, his household gods. So um, this is a really big value for the Romans, and it's certainly a big value for Augustus, because Augustus, as you remember, uh, had been adopted. He's the grand nephew, really, of Caesar, but he gets adopted by Caesar. He takes Caesar's name, and he, uh, the, his whole, in indeed, uh, explanation for his rise to power is to punish um, uh, essentially the people who assassinated his father, his adopted father, but his father, right? And so um, that is quite associated with the Romans with religious piety, and so Roman depictions have him bringing, like I say, these uh, household gods, which the Romans called the penates, so an old uh, thing in Roman religion is to have gods of your own household that are in you know, your own kind of family idols, your family gods, uh, and also these lares, which is to say an ancient kind of Roman guardian spirit um, that doesn't really have a, a, config, um, a comp comparable thing in, the, uh, in Greek religion. So, as we're getting then to this place where, uh, where Virgil has all this stuff in front of him, we can kind of see that he's kind of lucky, <laughs> I would say, or quite fortunate, or he's you know, also had to think about it to, to put all this together. Um, but his material is really fortunate. So there's a primary Greek sacred story the primary Greek sacred story, the Iliad. You know, so that's at the beginning of um, how the Greeks define themselves. It includes then the villains of the story, the Trojans, who nevertheless are portrayed as very noble, chivalrous, worthy ad adversaries. And indeed the gods of the Greek pantheon are on different sides of the story. A lot of them are, are in favor of the Trojans. So this Hector isn't coming off as being this uh, terrible, uh, you know, evil villain or something like that in the story. And so as a result, they've got a people that they can say, okay, Trojans, but without having it be, uh, you have to rewrite a bad villain or something like that. One of the number, one of their number, the Trojans, this guy Aeneas, he is already fated to go to preserve the royal line uh, and some traditions then found a city. And so the Romans for centuries by the time of Virgil were already making that association and claiming that they're that city that was founded. Uh, Julius Caesar himself had associated himself with Aeneas in his lifetime. He's wearing the boots and showing, showing that he is. So it's a, it's a story that you want to highlight. Uh, if you're working for um, somebody whose boss is Augustus, <laughs> so he's working for uh, his patron who's, whose boss Augustus promotes himself as this pious avenging son. And so Aeneas also has this 
this quality, right? So he's got filial piety as his number one iconic thing. So building on all those details then, Virgil is able to integrate Rome into the Greek sacred story without having to rely on a Greek origin, something like being uh, the son of Ulysses or the son of Odysseus, and that would have had to, you know, had this thing where Rome is sort of subordinate to Greek or heir of Greece. And in this way, it's able to be a fully legitimate rival of the Greeks the entire time, and they ultimately defeat the Greeks um, as a kind of a payback for the Trojan War as far as the Romans are concerned in their epic, right? So, how does the epic work? So the Aeneid itself is an epic. It follows those same epic conventions that uh, Virgil found when he himself is reading and studying the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer. Um, there's all kinds of things that we call, for example, in an epic convention, ornamental epithets. <laughs> So whenever um, you're gonna hear, come about upon a hero's name, it doesn't just call him Achilles, usually it'll say things like swift-footed Achilles, or Poseidon Earthshaker, wise Penelope, bright-eyed Athena. So um, that will happen even if, let's say, uh, we're in this, where we mentioned Poseidon, and he's not shaking the earth, <laughs> right? And so it's, a, it's an epithet that's associated with Poseidon. It isn't furthering the story, but it's part of the, um, the bag of tricks that allows a bard, an oral poet, in order to remember and also to compose and also to fill the meter uh, of their poetry. So it's one of the things that you need when you're doing oral composition. It's not as much one of the things you need when you're doing written composition, which you're not memorizing, but part of the idea that Virgil has is he wants this thing to sound like uh, the old thing. So in the same exact way um, that um, if we, for example, go to modern times, the Book of Mormon <laughs> is filled with all of this kind of King James Bible talk. <laughs> and so he, is, he you, know, you know, all of these kind of them, th these and thous and all this kind of thing. Well, this isn't how people talked in the 19th century when the Book of Mormon is being published, uh, but nevertheless it's meant to sound Bible-y and now people were thinking of that as being how the Bible talk is. I think, uh, I think in Rome people did um, habitually, the, the poets would read aloud. Yes. They would go to parties and they would read it allowed from their poems or somebody else would read aloud so these are these are, are written to be to be recited to yes be read aloud, um, to be performed that's right it is written it is is meant to be read aloud for sure they haven't invented reading quietly yet oh. so they they can't so in fact the reading aloud is all they do it's not until we it's not until four centuries later when we get to saint anselm that then that suddenly he, they've invented reading silently and augustine's like sees he's doing that and he's like what are you doing <laughs> you know that's amazing who was it who was who, pe who astonished people by reading without moving his lips was it anselm saint anselm i'm just not anselm ambrose ambrose of milan was it it's ambrose is what i'm trying to say <laughs> Uh, anyway, Ambrose of Milan. <laughs> anyway, so he's, um, yeah, not Anselm of Beck, Ambrose of Milan. So Augustine is amazed by him. So it's, it's this, you could, um, we'd all have a party trick if we were around in, you know, <laughs> in second century, because no, no one knew how to do that. Okay, so one of those things then, uh, then an ornamental epithet that we have all the time is pious Aeneas. So Aeneas' piety, his filial piety, his devotion to the patriarchal line is, is brought out. Um, there's all other conventions like in medius race, so in other words the idea that the epic is beginning in the middle and so it's starting in the middle of all the events and then at a certain point you tell the backstory, and so uh, and that happens in the Iliad and the Odyssey as well uh, and then they get and they tell the end afterwards right and so those are epic conventions um, it's poetry uh, with reason not rhyme so we say like a lot of people's poetry is has neither rhyme nor reason <laughs> you know <laughs> nowadays um, but which is to say a meter to it as opposed to rhymed poetry so it's in the middle ages that uh, latin develops rhyming poetry which if you have like uh, carmina burana where it's, it's amazing rhyme schemes that isn't how it worked in the ancient world uh, instead it's done in the epic uh, meter that uh, again is from the Iliad and the Odyssey which is called dactylic hexameter which oopsie gotta go back sorry went the wrong way here okay pressing the wrong button here which means that there are six different of the feet so hex six and then and dactylic because either one of these is going to be a dactyl or a spondy and except for the second to last one which is always a dactyl and then there's either going to be a spondy or a trochee at the end and so that essentially means 
It could be long, long, or long, short, short, long, short, short, long, 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 short, short, long, short, you know, like that is how it's going to always go. And I'm really bad at um, reading metered poetry, but it would be something like, <laughs> on the English one down here, uh, which is done in dactylic hexameter, down in a deep, dark dell sat an old cow munching a beanstalk, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so it would be read like that, you know, maybe with a, a lyre, uh, but not, um, not rhymed, right? The way we think of poetry. So if we look at it in Latin here, and we start right at the, the first line of the Aeneid, uh, which is, you know, so it'll be, you know, long, short, short, long, short, short, long, 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 short, short, long, long, right? And so, arma virumque cano troia qui primus ab ori, right? And so, I sing of arms on the man, that man who first from the shores of Troy sailed, you know, that sort of thing. And so that's the beginning. He's singing about uh, the arms, the warfare, essentially, and also the man who, um, who, who found uh, the origin in any way here of Rome. So we'll look a little bit here at the, uh, the structure of what um, Virgil's doing. It's pretty creative, and so he's definitely trying to do this thing when we're doing a sequel. He's um, also doing all kinds of things. Although it's written in Latin, not Greek, it's showing that um, it's of the same exact kind of form as the precursors as Homer. So there's 12 books total. The first six are modeled on the Odyssey. So it's Aeneas wandering around like Odysseus or Ulysses wandering around in the Odyssey. Uh, and then the second half of it is the warfare in Italy that's the precursor then to Rome's foundation. And that's essentially like the warfare that's all through the Iliad. Uh, and so it begins, as we sent, mentioned, in Medius race. So he's already done almost all of his wandering. Uh, and so he's being blown ashore to Carthage. When he's at Carthage, he meets Dido. And he tells her now, in retrospective, the backstory. Where did they all come from? And so he tells the whole story of that Trojan horse, this very famous episode. A lot of times people are always amazed. They think, wait a second, the Iliad is the story of the Trojan War, but the whole Trojan horse thing isn't even in that, even in that epic, and it's not, right? Because Homer in the Iliad is actually not singing about the Trojan War. He's singing about the wrath of Achilles, right? And so it's following Achilles to um, Achilles' death and the recovery of, uh, of, of the armor and that kind of thing, Hector's armor. But it's not all the way to the end of the Trojan War. The Trojan War's still got a lot of years left by the time the Iliad ends. It's a 10-year siege, so the question is, yeah, and I don't, I have to, we'll have to do a lecture on the Iliad so I mean remember, <laughs> but anyway, there's several years left. I don't remember how many, but essentially, uh, anyway, it goes on. You, do you know? I, I believe uh, that the, uh, sort of the, uh, the Iliad uh, is a last year of the war. It's already the last year. Yeah. Okay, they just don't get to the end. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's long, but it doesn't get to the end. Okay, that's it. All right, and so, so, oopsie, I'm, I keep pressing the wrong button there, sorry. So, um, so after that, we have some of Achilles wandering around by boat, the same way that Odysseus does. Um, then, after he's told all these stories, um, he falls, he and Queen Dido, especially Dido, falls in love with him, but they both fall in love together, and uh, she ultimately kills herself. Then he wanders on, or as he's wandering on, um, he has, his dad also dies, and so they have funeral games for his dad in Sicily at, at you guessed it, that town, Segesta, <laughs> that claimed that they were also founded by uh, the Trojans and they were so important in that first Punic War. Well, they make, it, they make their way into the book right here. Uh, then he also from there goes into the underworld. This is one of the things that Odysseus does in the Odyssey. And so modeled on that same part of this Odyssey, uh, Aeneas also goes down there, but he goes down there with uh, the goal of having this vision of what this future is going to be. He's supposed to be founding the city. What wonderful thing will, will occur in the far future in Virgil's time, let's say, uh, when, when he goes down there, you can see that in the underworld. Then they get finally to Italy. Uh, you set up a, they set up the bad guys. The bad guys here, uh, Turnus and some of the other uh, Latins are on the wrong side of it. Um, they aren't as much the, the level of the heroic guys as the Trojans were in the, in the Greek epic. Um, 
they make alliances with the other Latins, and, uh, and there's also kind of another future vision of what's going to happen uh, by looking, for example, at, um, uh, at a shield that his mom gives him, so that's showing, in fast forwarding to this amazing battle of Actium, so tying Augustus into the story from all the way back here. Um, the bad guys, the Turnus attacks the Trojan camp, they have warfare, there's also war among the gods as they're uh, taking sides between, generally speaking, Juno or Hera, uh, Jupiter's wife, is always on the uh, bad side. <laughs> so, and so she's in favor of Carthage and, and against the Romans. Um, then there's a funeral, uh, a funeral for Evander. We mentioned Evander, he's one of these allies, so he's been helping out. Uh, and then finally, there's the final defeat of the bad guys, right? And so that's the warfare period. period. Elizabeth. Okay, never mind. We'll push, well, we're gonna push on here. Okay. I don't, yeah, I'm not sure if the mic is on. Do you have a? I do have a quick question, actually. Yes. So by this point, Carthage had already been destroyed, right? That's right. The final Punic War had happened. Yes. Um, why then, if the whole of the Aeneid was to serve a kind of political purpose as propaganda, did they create such a tragic end for Queen Dido? To yeah. Like establish that rivalry. I don't really see what the political purpose would be of that. Right. I like that anticipatory question. I'm not going to immediately try. I would normally go on a tangent, but there's not a tangent because we're going to get there. Got it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm. So I like that. So we'll just mention. Um, we're not going to go through this, but anyway, uh, there's all of these wanderings, and these are sort of like the wanderings of. of so we start off in Troy. Uh, he goes and finds where some of the other Trojans have been hanging out and trying to make, uh, make their own way. He also goes past a lot of the different places, for example, where Odysseus had been. And so he sees the Cyclops and other kinds of, uh, you know, it's one of the things you do in a sequel, right? <laughs> you go and see some of the, the highlights from the last book. Uh, and then, like I say, at the beginning of this, of the beginning of the book, but all the way into the middle of the journey, he's blown here to Carthage who, as you just mentioned, has been this great rival in Roman history, but has now been destroyed uh, and totally incorporated in. Uh, and then from uh, Carthage then makes his way up in the, and that last half of the book is taking place up here, that war, right? So we mentioned again that it's, the Sicilian part is happening in that, that long ago first Punic ally, Segesta here um, uh, in Sicily. And that's also where they go into, oh, they go into the underworld here. Anyway, okay, so I wanna look then you know, we don't have a huge amount of time because <laughs> I did a lot of context and background, but I want to just look at three little episodes, including the Dido episode, um, from the Aeneid so we can kind of have a sense of it. And so one of the, um, one of the lines of Latin that I have memorized <laughs> is quid quid es, temeo deneas, adona ferentis, which is to say, um, don't trust, the, you know, there's another line in front of this, but essentially don't trust the horse Trojans. Whatever it is, I fear the Greeks even when bearing gifts. So beware Greeks bearing gifts, right? <laughs> and so uh, this is quite a famous um, statue in the Vatican, I think, of La Aquan, who is a uh, Trojan uh, prophet, who when he sees the, um, the Trojan horse, <laughs> which the Greeks actually make the horse. But anyway, when he sees this and he knows it's a trick or he, he thinks it's, he, we, it's, at least he thinks it's gonna have no good to it, uh, uh, then at a certain point, sea serpents come and a, as he's making his kind of complaint, kill him and his sons. Uh, and so in the story here of the Aeneid, as it's told, um, the Trojans are like, oh, well he said don't trust the horse, but then he gets eaten by sea serpents. So maybe we should li shouldn't listen to him, <laughs> right? So. Um, this is then that story of the fall of Troy, the Trojan horse, and this is the main place where we have it, is the Aeneid as a story. So then in truth, a strange terror steals through each shuddering heart, and they say that Laocoon uh, La has justly suffered for his crime. So the fact that he didn't trust the horse and that he hit it with his spear, uh, in wounding the sacred oak tree with his spear, so this um, important uh, gift by hurling its wicked shaft into its trunk. Uh, they, they're, they think that he's been punished by the gods for that kind of impiety. So now they've decided, okay, we're taking the horse now. <laughs> so pull the statue to her house, the goddess's house, they shout, and offer prayers to the goddess's divinity. So we breached the wall and opened up the defenses of the city, all prepare themselves for work, and they set up the wheels, allowing movement under its feet and stretch hemp ropes round its neck. 
the engine of fate mounts our walls pregnant with armed men. <laughs> so obviously all the Greeks are inside the horse if you don't know the, the story of the Trojan horse and now the Trojans have have uh, foolishly brought it into the city. So um, when the Greeks get out and uh, the battle ensues, um, everything immediately falls apart. Uh, Aeneas is fighting and he keeps on having to fall back and fall back. He's in the palace at a certain point and everything's burning down. And at that point, Aeneas catches sight of Helen, Helen of Troy, for whom the entire Iliad uh, technically she's the casus belli, she's the cause for the war. Uh, the fact that Paris, the Trojan prince, had stolen her away from uh, the Spartans uh, is the whole reason for the war, technically, right? So I was alone now, this is now Aeneas's words, I was alone now when I saw the daughter of Tyndareus, Helen, close to Vesta's portal, hiding silently in the secret shrine. The bright flames gave me light as I wandered, gazing everywhere randomly, afraid of Trojans, this is her now, she, Helen, afraid of Trojans, angered at the fall of Troy, Greek vengeance, and the fury of a husband she deserted, she, the mutual curse of Troy and her own country, had concealed herself and crouched, a hated thing by the altar. So uh, things have not gone well for Helen, but nevertheless, <laughs> He's mad because of this whole war has killed, has destroyed everything, right? So fire blazed in my spirit, anger rose to avenge my fallen land and to exact the punishment for her wickedness. Shall she, unarmed, see Sparta again and her native Mycenae and see her house and husband, parents and children and go in the triumphant role of a queen attended by a crowd of Trojan women and Phrygian servants. So all of the Trojan women are now gonna be slaves and they're gonna be taken back to Sparta. When Priam has been put to the sword, Troy consumed with fire, the Dardanian shore soaked again and again with blood. And so he's really ready, he wants to kill her, right? Um, but he also says to himself, it's not gonna be big and honorable to kill an unarmed woman, but it will make me feel good. So he's kind of debating with himself at that point. And then his mother, uh, Venus, Aphrodite, and it's Venus in the, in the Aeneid here, appears and so she convinces him, you know, stop worrying about this, let Helen go. And now you should be worrying about instead about your own family, go save your family, which brings us then to that very, very famous uh, uh, image of him with his dad and the son in his hand, his wife. Um, Virgil actually writes a story <laughs> Uh, so that Aeneas is actually loyal to the whole family. So after he has saved his uh, dad and his uh, son, he realizes his wife didn't make it to the rendezvous point, and so he runs back and has a whole scene trying to find her, but she's already uh, been killed. And so then he's, so he's not a bad guy <laughs> in Virgil, or at least not meant to be, uh, even though he wasn't obviously taking his wife as his first priority, it was third <laughs> priority, but anyway, she doesn't make it. So next ep little episode, we saw when um, uh, I mentioned when he goes to Sicily and they have funeral games, his dad has died. And so now he goes to the underworld. Uh, and this is a big uh, Renaissance painting here of his uh, descent into the underworld and all of the different visions that he's seen there. Um, this is a, um, an imitation of what had happened uh, in the Odyssey of Homer, but it, it becomes quite different because the ideas of the afterlife and underworld have evolved or at least are different for the Romans than they had been for the early ancient Greeks. And so um, what we see here is he, just a little part of his vision. It goes on and on and on as he tours the underworld. Uh, he sees um, first uh, those that are the wicked that are punished in Tartarus that are essentially in hell. Uh, and he later is gonna see the blessed that are in Elysium, which is where his dad is. So here, as he's seeing in Tartarus, are those who hated their brothers in life or struck a parent or contrived to default a client or who crouched alone over riches they'd made without setting aside any for their kin. Their crowd is largest. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, so you can see in there already what some of the Roman values are here by kind of seeing who's getting punished and who's being punished in hell in terms of um, not uh, being thoughtful of your family but or doing other kinds of fraud, right? Without setting aside any for their kin. Okay, I already said that one. Those who were killed for adultery or who pursued civil war, not fearing to break their pledges to their masters, shut in, they see their punishment. Don't ask to know that punishment or what kind of suffering drowns them. Some roll huge stones or hang spread, eagle, spread eagled or on wheel spokes. Wretched Theseus sits still and will sit for eternity. 
Uh, Phlegius, the most unfortunate, warns them all and bears witness in a loud voice among the shades, learn justice, be warned, and don't despise the gods. So these are um, mythic figures from Greek mythology. Um, uh, the, the latter here is a little known guy, but anyway, Phlegius is a, um, a guy who was mad at uh, Apollo for um, allowing his daughter to be killed, and he went and burned Apollo's temple down. <laughs> And then Apollo cursed him to hell for forever, and so that's a figure like that. Um, Theseus, uh, we think of him as being a you know a hero, the guy who defeated the Minotaur, um, but he did a lot of stuff. Like for example, uh, went to hell to um, steal uh, Hades' wife, <laughs> Persephone, and things like that. So he did a lot of different things. And so you can imagine he's not popular down here, <laughs> and so maybe that's why he's being punished. So the idea of it is we're seeing famous people in the afterlife and uh, specifically Virgil is placing some people in hell and some people in paradise uh, in his story here. So uh, he goes on with some of the other kinds of things that uh, they're being punished for. Here's one who sold his country for gold. This is maybe something that um, Virgil's thinking about as crimes that have been occurring in the Civil War, right? Uh, and set up a despotic lord, one who made law and remade it for a price. He entered his daughter's bed and a forbidden marriage. All of them dared monstrous sin and did what they dared. So this is really then a direct model for Dante's Inferno. And we'll have a lecture on this later too. Um, but it's not only um, just kind of like it, it's the direct model, right? And so um, uh, Dante is very aware of Virgil. And indeed, Virgil becomes Dante, Dante's guide as he's going through uh, the Christianized version of the afterlife. And when he's visiting the areas of purgatory and hell, um, it's Virgil who is his guide to those places. And several of the kind of figures that we've already seen in uh, Virgil's afterlife are you know, similarly placed in Dante's afterlife. Okay, um, one of the things though that we do while we're down there, and this is where we get to that propaganda value, <laughs> So when he comes to his father's shade, Anchises, and Anchises gives him this vision of what's to come, why are you, he has had to sacrifice all this stuff to kind of keep on going uh, in order to found the city. So why is he doing it? Well, turn your two eyes this way and see this people, your own Romans. Here is Caesar and of all the line of Eulus, you know, which is to say your son Ascanius, Eulus. Um, he all uh, shall one day pass under the dome of the great sky. This is the man, this one, of whom so often you have heard the promise. Caesar Augustus, son of the deified, son of Julius Caesar, who shall, be, uh, who shall bring once again the age of gold to Latium, uh, to the land where Saturn reigned in early times. So we're seeing right here a vision and a prophecy that not only will you know, uh, your son, Eulus, <laughs> You know, there'll be a line that goes all the way down until you get to uh, the later Romans, of whom the, lead, the best is going to be Caesar, the divine, and then his, his son, Augustus, who will renew, you know, this kind of golden age that um, has been so lacking lately, right? Okay. Finally, we'll just look at Aeneas' uh, romance with Dido, which is the most famous episode, and we'll talk about the question you have had posed. Uh, and so, and actually the most of the Renaissance paintings that we have are Aeneas and Dido. So the, this is obviously the, the story that has taken the most hold. So Carthage has been Rome's traditional rival in the Western Mediterranean, but by the time Virgil's writing, it's been destroyed. So there were two Punic Wars that were important. And then finally, there is a, uh, a war that, is, that Cato the censor urges where he continuously says, Delenda es Carthago, <laughs> you know, and which is to say, Carthage must be destroyed. In other words, Rome will never be great unless we take the city that's really been, you know, prostrated and isn't anything anymore, and conquer it and sow salt, and uh, it will never rise again, right? And so that's already happened. So one of the things that happens at the very beginning of the Aeneid, a storm forces Aeneas and all the other Trojan exiles to take refuge in Carthage, where he meets Dido, uh, the city's founded queen, founding queen. She is portrayed, though, um, as a very strong, wise leader in her own right. 
and after he tells all of his stories of the Trojan War, the Trojan Horse, and everything like that, she's loving the stories. <laughs> she's loving how um, he's telling them and, and what a great noble catch he is compared to she's a widow and her she doesn't have any other um, Phoenician princes to marry and she doesn't want to marry any of the local uh, North African guys. And so therefore, um, uh, her sister anyway says, you really should be marrying to this guy. Um, and one of the things that happens in the story is it doesn't hurt that when you're having, you know, like you're going after love affairs, if your mother's Venus, and it turns out then your half brother is Cupid, right? <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, so his half brother is Cupid, and his mother has dressed Cupid up to be Ascanius or Eulus, that little boy. And so Ascanius doesn't even make it to Carthage or whatever because Cupid's dressed up pretending to be him, and he's hanging out through that whole time. And so you can imagine uh, that what he's doing, you know, in terms of you know having love happen, right? Anyway, so um, they two they fall in love. They have an affair, which Dido probably right, quite rightly regards as a common law marriage, you know, since they've consummated the marriage. And then um, she's imagining that he's going to stay and be king of Carthage with her or rule jointly with her. Um, but at that point, Mercury, uh, Jupiter's herald, comes and re reminds him, uh, you know, remember the duty thing, that whole destiny prophecy thing, the whole reason Poseidon saved you was because you got to go found a city of your own. And it's only then he was, he was probably quite content on his own to just go ahead and live there. Um, but he decides to leave. And so um, we'll just look at uh, uh, the love affair before he leaves. So now she, Dido, leads Aeneas with her around the walls, showing her Sidonian, which is a word for Phoenician here, right? Punic, Carthaginian wealth, Sidonian wealth, and the cities she's built. She begins to speak and stops in mid-flow. Now she longs for the banquet again as the day wanes, yearning madly to hear about the Trojan adventures once more, and hangs once more on the speaker's lips. And then when they have departed, and the moon in turn has quenched her light, and the setting constellations urge sleep, she grieves alone in the empty hall and lies on the couch she le he left. So she's pretty starstruck here, or love struck right at first, right? So this is love at first sight, and she's, well, Cupid's been there doing this, right? <laughs> All right, so absent from, uh, absent she hears him, I'm sorry, absent she hears him, absent sees him, or hugs Ascanius on her lap, taken with this image of his father, so as to see deceive her silent passion, the towers she started no longer rise. The young men no longer carry out their drill or work on the harbor and the battlements for defense in war. The interrupted work is left hanging, the huge threatening walls, the sky reaching cranes. So she just doesn't care about being queen at this point. She just likes this guy, right? And so that's how love, if all, much in love, uh, this character has fallen, Dido. All right, nevertheless, Aeneas, <laughs> being reminded of his uh, duty by the gods to leave. He sneaks out of town, um, uh, leaving her in her grief. Uh, and so she determines that her only course of action is suicide, uh, which is an honorable thing in the, in, as Romans understood it. Um, and so um, uh, that's where she does. And so she says as she's now um, about to kill herself, she has some time to curse Aeneas for um, you know, falling, making her fall in love and then leaving. And he says, and as her curse to Aeneas is, if it must be that the accursed one, Aeneas, should reach the harbor and sail to the shore, if Jove's destiny for him requires it, there his goal. Still troubled in war by the armies of a proud race, exiled from his territories, torn from Eulus' embrace, let him beg help and watch the shameful death of his people. Then, when he is surrendered to a peace without justice, may he not enjoy his kingdom or the days he longed for, but let him die before his time, lie unburied on the sand. This I pray, these last words I pour out with my own blood. So that's about as bad an end as you could have happen, or she's at least longing for it. He doesn't quite have all those things happen to him. But she does um, also then give one last kind of plea to her own descendants. Uh, then, O Tyrians, you Carthaginians, in other words, <clears throat> pursue my hatred against his whole line and the race to come, which is to say the Romans, so Carthaginians here, and offer it as a tribute to my ashes. Let there be no love or treaties between our people. Rise, some unknown avenger from my dust who will preserve, I'm sorry, who will pursue the Trojan colonists with fire and sword now or in time to come. 
whenever there is strength, I'm sorry, whenever the strength is granted him, I pray that shore be opposed to shore, water to wave, weapon to weapon, let them fight them and their descendants. So this is a, um, an explanation of the, the death match between Carthage and Rome. But why is it important and why, uh, why uh, to your question, is it, um, Dido such a sympathetic character? <laughs> And why does it have to be, you know, they could have had any number of villainous Carthaginians that could have um, spurned kind of this, this end. So I'm going to propose here that the immediate um, reason that um, Virgil has for uh, demonizing a tempting foreign queen is because his patron's master, Augustus, has had as his rival Antony, right? And Antony's... Uh, uh, dalliance with, affair with, common law marriage to Cleopatra, um, this queen of the Hellenistic East. And so even though we're talking about um, this historic rival, Carthage, that doesn't exist anymore, a lot of times what happens is you're there's the echo of the contemporary political situation that you were either inspired by or commenting on, right? And so um, the irony, though, is <laughs> that uh, even though he may have been kind of writing it that way and writing um, Dido to be, you know, this kind of seductress and, uh, and, and, and maybe an echo of Cleopatra, what ends up happening is, is that the character is so compelling and so compelling, for example, in contrast to Aeneas, who is just always having to be kind of a stoic Roman uh, guy who is relatively passionless and, and upright and who follows his duty. I mean, we don't read the story today and say, well, he, he was told by the gods that he had to do his duty and think, oh, well, that's very sympathetic. <laughs> Rather, um, what's happened throughout history as the story has been read, yeah, is that he's the son of a bitch, as, as Libba says, <laughs> and Dido is the one who's been, um, I think, felt uh, the, very sympathetic to, right, the, the tragedy. And so, anyway, as a result, maybe not, we, we, you know, when you're writing stuff, you don't always know what's going to be the thing that you're known for at the end, right? And so, in this particular case, it may be um, ironic that this is what gets pulled out of it, that this is not actually what Virgil necessarily wanted. Yeah. I'm just wondering um, what moral stature might a woman's uh, uh, emotional uh, subtext, irrational uh, demands on a man have held versus a man's duty to his country. Right. Yeah, so that's a good point. In, in so, no, so I agree. So, I, so that's a, I think that's a very good contrast. So, as from what Virgil, I think, was wanting to show, I think he is actually showing that someone who has has fallen madly in love, you know, there is, whether it's because of Cupid being there directly doing it, you know, but let that love is a madness. And what did that, what happened? So she had been this um, strong queen that was busily producing Carthage and everything like that. But as soon as she's fallen in love, she's sitting on the couch pining, she's wishing he would come back and tell stories again. And it says directly, you know, that none of her city's getting built anymore. Nobody's working on the cranes or anything like that because she's not there um, doing that kind of a thing. And so, so um, yeah, so it is on the one hand, um, the good old Roman sexism of denigrating women in the first place, that women are gonna fall prey to this kind of um, thing more. <laughs> But I think that Virgil is probably, what he wanted to show was that that kind of, you know, giving into your passions that way is probably bad compared to the guy who is thinking about filial piety, his destiny, his duty, and all those kind of things. It's just that upon reflection for the last 2,000 years, not everybody's agreed with him, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> okay. So, so with that, um, what I want to, you know, what I think we've seen, and we've seen, you know, kind of anyway, with a little bit of a picture, I, I emphasized a lot more kind of the background, the context, where the story comes from, what Virgil was working on, than the content itself, although I kind of showed you what the whole structure is. So I, I kind of want to leave that with you and urge you that it's a good story, it holds up. You may want to um, read the text with this kind of an introductory background. But we also may be in doing it, um, and we see uh, when we look at how Virgil is affecting myths that the Romans are taking very seriously. And yet you can kind of see, we, we kind of are a little maybe jaded about it because he is obviously you know, creating a lot of the details or making stuff up is what we'd think about it. And indeed, um, kind of heavy hand on bringing some of the propaganda in even, right? And yet, um, this is still at the center of 
um, Roman identity and Roman religion. And so we should also be looking at this, I think, um, with different eyes in terms of how we look at any ancient text, uh, any ancient scripture, and how those are being composed by those authors who are creating identity stories, whether it's uh, biblical or any, any of the other kind of ancient texts that we maybe read somewhat naively as if people um, you know, are thinking of it as history when it's being written. Elizabeth. I have a question, but in, in, in I also wanted to mention a book that maybe, maybe some of us, maybe more people have read than they have read the Aeneid, and that is Watership Down, oh. which I think is very much based on the Aeneid. Here are these people. They're rabbits, but they're people. They flee from a city that's about to fall. Oh. They cross country, meeting dangers of various sorts. They come to what looks like a haven uh, where there's plenty of food and the other rabbits are fat and they seem to be living a good life but they discover there's a price to be paid. The food has been put out by the local farmer, oh. and the prices he puts out snares, and every so often a rabbit vanishes, having been killed and taken for food. Wow. And then they carry on, and they found their own city there. And one of the rabbits, is, he's a seer, but he's not like Cassandra. The other rabbits do believe what he says. And they dig themselves a, a new warren and all is well, but their leader realizes there's something missing. They have no does, not even one. Oh dear. <laughs> no does means no kittens, and no kittens means in a few years no warren. What to do? Well, they go to another warren, and uh, eventually they do come home with a bunch of does, but the other warren is there is, is ruled by a chief rabbit who is very warlike and very possessive. He doesn't want anybody leaving. And, uh, and he, when, when these people do, when these rabbits do go home with a bunch of does, then uh, the, this leader of the warren they came from comes to make war on them, to try to destroy them and take the does back. And by means of a trick, they defeat him. Yeah. And it ends up with everybody living happily, not ever after, because <laughs> rabbits don't live forever, but happily. I see. I, I, I guess, so I have not read it. I mean, I, oh. I remember when I was... You have a treat coming. Yeah, I'll have to read it. I mean, I was in, I, when I was seven, I saw a cartoon of it. But mm. I just remember mean rabbit. <laughs> but anyway, so, yeah. but, yeah, but it does sound like, so like, for example, you're talking, but part of that story there is like the rape of the Sabian women, right? Yes. So after the, after the, um, it's not, you know, after the, the Trojans here or whatever, the early, these early, actually the Romulans, uh, after Romulus is, is around and they've founded Rome, they find that same problem. They don't have, you know, Rome needs, Mars needs women, right? <laughs> Rome needs women and so they go to the Sabians. Yeah. yeah. And the question I had is this, that uh, traditionally among even the strictest, uh, most <laughs> puritanical Christians uh, who have, who, who, who abhor and shun uh, non-Christian literature of any kind, they make an exception for Virgil. Oh, yeah. Do you know why? Do you know anything about that? Well, so there's a lot of, um, so throughout, throughout um, you know, anyway, the time, time period from Jerome and everybody onward, Augustine, there is a, there's, there's definitely been a um, exception that Christians have made in terms of a lot of the classics, and Virgil's right at the top of the list. And so what Augustine called that, uh, using a biblical analogy, is that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they despoiled the Egyptians. <laughs> And so they didn't take they didn't take all the Egyptian gold idols um, and and bring them and worship them, but they took the gold, <laughs> you know. And so the idea of it is um, the analogy that Augustine has is the classics are filled with uh, you know all of this am amazing stuff, uh, lessons, knowledge, uh, other other kinds of things. We can take that with us as Christians uh, going forward, <laughs> but we don't have to. But we we can't. We're not taking, for example, belief in Venus as a as a goddess or any of those kind of things. But rather, we're taking though, um, for example, how great an author Cicero is, so that we can learn how to do our Latin well. And so, several of the um, 
let's say early Latin fathers, you know, were accused of um, loving Cicero more than the, you know the Bible and things like that, uh, and so that was always a, a danger. But essentially, because the um, the language of the church and Christianity and science and everything like that throughout the Middle Ages was Latin, and all of the all of the grammar, everything, all of those texts that they studied were the original classic texts. Um, those were all preserved, and that's why we have them all, right? Because the Christian monks copied them. So yeah. otherwise, we wouldn't have them. Yeah. Another question um, is the fact that the people that we used to call gypsies call themselves Roma. As what has that got to do with Rome? It, yeah, it's unrelated. So the Rome, the, their their own uh, name for themselves, the Roma, is not related to our the word Rome. <laughs> Um, and then the, why we call them gypsies is a, uh, because we, we were, because English people thought they were from Egypt, yeah. which they are not. <laughs> so anyway, so Egypt, it means Egypt sees, right? So anyway, but that's um, one of the places that many different um, people thought they were from. So, yeah. Yeah, just I was, uh, back to uh, Elizabeth's point on Dante. It, it's telling that even though there was some um, uh, let's say, uh, admiration for the, the great uh, Greek epics, you know, on the part of the Christians, nonetheless, in Dante's vision, all the Greek greats are in hell, nonetheless. All, yeah. They're all pagans. And so, yeah, but, but... There's a couple, there's a couple people that do, I think a couple people like make it into purgatory, but almost everybody's in the first circle of hell, oh, hell. which yeah. is pretty nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so he tries to make it like, in other words, there, there's lots of circles of hell, and the first one is where all the good pagans are, you know? And so, and so you're like, oh, it's okay. But there, I think It's not that hot there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I was going to make a comment, just, uh, you know, another instance of... Um, yeah, uh, of borrowing a, a, a Greek epic for um, uh, for the for uh, modern like pop uh, sort of entertainment is or, or well, Watership Down isn't pop, but but for modern uh, entertainment is uh, the Coen Brothers movie uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, starring George Clooney. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but George Clooney basically is Odysseus. So if anybody has a chance to see that movie, it's wonderful. Oh, okay, yeah, we should watch that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just a quick comment is that the early Christians were also known for kind of claiming these virtuous pagans as Christians, yes. right? Like there's yeah. the myth that Aristotle converted right before he right. threw himself into the tides of the Euripus, which probably did not actually happen, right? <laughs> no. um, I, I just wanted to point out an interesting parallel that you may want to comment on, which is, um, as far as claiming descent from a mythological figure, this yeah. was something that the Habsburgs actually did later with Emperor Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor, who claimed descent through genealogists from Hector. Um, oh. And that was, of course, considered a successor state to Rome, or at least so they wanted it to be. Yeah. So it's really interesting that that kind of is an ongoing thing throughout history, this hearkening yeah. back to the mythological figure. Yeah, I wasn't aware of the Habsburg genealogy tracing all the way back to Hector. That's very interesting. I well, mean, I, yeah. he, he wanted them to be traced back to okay. Hector, so he got his court genealogist to kind of work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, the, so the, the Merovingians had this, um, this legend already that they were descended from, uh, I don't know that Hector, but anyways, descended from Priam via, via this guy, Francus. <laughs> you know, but, but they didn't make enough geneal, they didn't make enough, uh, anywhere near enough uh, gen uh, generations in order to get there. So it's actually, they weren't sophisticated enough to do it. But by the time you get to the, um, the 17th, the 18th and 19th century especially, um, the royal genealogists, like you say, you know, were much better at creating a whole bunch of names <laughs> in, order to, in order to get you all the way back. So there's another, can we get, can I, can you hand him the mic? I'm sorry. Uh, just a short comment, I have never seen uh, yeah, I have never heard of genealogy that old. Normally, kind of they stopped at Julius Caesar or somewhere, kind of, or at some Roman emperor and no, drew from the there. No, by the time the 19th century Hector, got rolled around, they, they yeah. traced you all the way back to Adam. Yeah. And so those those 19th century genealogists will will make you get you to Adam. Um, and I know, I, for example, because my mom is a genealogist, she's president of the Minnesota Genealogical Society. So we have, I have. Um, 
she's traced a line that gets to Charlemagne, and so once you get to Charlemagne, then you can get all the way back to Adam, according to the, the fake 19th century genealogies anyway, right? And so, so it's, not, it's not real, uh, but anyway, that's, that's how, it's, it's been around for a couple hundred years anyway, in terms, of, in terms of that. They don't have that level of it back in the an ancient sources, though. They weren't as caring about making, there's a big beget list in the Bible, but they don't have that, they don't have that for uh, the Greeks and Romans. Okay, folks, that was a long lecture, so we will just say thank you. <laughs> um.